This is the island of the line. I always admired documentaries on, on the lines and going in, in, in Africa and whatnot, and what they do and how they survive and, <coughs> and everything, how they work. But if you ever looked at the, the, the eyes of the line, they were made to see long distances and they were made to see very well at night. They uh, have this uh, layer in the back of their eyes that reflects the moonlight and allows them to see at least 10 times better than the human eye can see. And so the eyes are, are, are the pupils are enlarged to receive uh, all the light that's coming in, it bounces off the cornea, it gets into the cornea and all the cones and stuff like that. Their eyes, if you even see it, the eyes, eyes. You know how a football player or a baseball player puts black underneath their eyes? Well, the lines, they have that white patch underneath their eyes because it reflects light into their eyes a lot better. And that's what they need to see long distances and to see movements and make distinctions and stuff. Do you know the book of Ephesians talks about our eyes being enlightened to the things of God? And sometimes the world that we live in and the things that we experience and the pains in our life cause us, our eyes, to go dim. And we don't see things very clearly. And, and so the goal of the message this morning is to first help you understand that you can see clearer. If you want to see clearer. You know, it's like um, when I went to the eye doctor not long ago to, to, to have my annual exam and stuff. And he put drops in my eyes to dilate my eyes so he could see in my eyes and see if there's anything going on that, that needs um, attention. It's like our souls need dilating. It's like we need to open up our hearts and open up our minds and, and definitely our spiritual eyes to the things of God. And welcome. You know, sometimes the devil plays tricks on us and stuff. And sometimes if we don't feel right or smell right or look right to us, we close off immediately. Instead of dilating our hearts, we constrict them. You know, I think if we dilate our hearts, if we have the eyes of the line, if we really are super sensitive to looking for God, then I think that we can see His plan easier, that we can accept His plan more readily, and we can be obedient to His will each and every day. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we read this. So we don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For, the, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And as we look not to the things that are seen, Amen. as we are not looking to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Amen. I couldn't help but notice, especially in the last portion of that scripture, how the meaning of it jumps out to me. It's like our life on earth in comparison to eternity. It doesn't last long. 60, 70, 80 years, 90 years. A hundred if you're blessed. That in comparison to eternity, keep on adding the zeros to the hundreds and you'll add eternity to it. As a matter of fact, you'll not stop adding the zeros. So, yeah, pick the oldest person in the world and it's just still not comparable to eternity. And it's hard for us to fathom eternity because we see death every day. We're reminded of it when someone young dies in the newspaper. Or when our loved ones are passed and stuff and we grieve and stuff. It's hard for us to imagine eternity when we've got so much temporary around us. Marriages are temporary. Relationships in general are temporary. Good people are temporary. They come in, they leave. And so nothing's really eternal in our lives right now, but that's what we're seeing. And God's Word is filled with the eternal. God's Word is filled to tell you that there is an everlasting love that God above has for you. But we see love being short-lived. 
being snuffed out. The light's going away and relationships are ending and for all sorts of reasons. And people don't even know who they are anymore, let alone what gender they're born with. And we, so these things are temporary and it's hard for us to see the eternal. But yet we're directed and, and told that where our heart is, there where our heart, our treasures also be. And in that same chapter, it tells us that we should not put any trust in the things that can be stolen and rusts away and, and, and taken from us, things that are temporary. But rather, it says, build up treasures in heaven where nobody can steal it away, where it does not decay away, and it's eternal, not temporary. God, I believe, is using the temporary to prepare us for the eternal. Can I say that again? God is using our temporary to prepare us for our eternal. It's like we need to fix our gaze on the things which cannot be seen. You know, I can't help but watch cats and lions specifically. When they're looking one way, their ears are turning towards the noise. It's like, so they're always on alert for movement or sound. Um, it's like, we can't even get our focus off our problems. And I think God, as we're facing our problems, would be like a lion. Our ears are tuned to the voice of God. And we need to hear from God in a way that we can address our problems to get through our problems. But instead of, I think a lot of us are becoming victims of our situations. And we're all telling everybody in sort of like a kleptomaniac environment, we're saying everybody about our woes. We're telling everybody about our problems in a way that we hope to get value, in a way that we hope to get attention, in a way that, that robs God of His ability to work with you and through you and on the problem at hand. I mean, I think uh, some of our media outlets, is, that's what it's used for. It's a microphone for kleptomaniacs. People to tell other people about their problems. All to get the response of, oh, poor little you. God didn't create victims, He created victors. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't tear up. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be so callous to say we shouldn't be sensitive to problems. I'm just saying, we're talking more about our problems than we are our solution. You know, I want to tell you, in April, 20, April 24th, 1990, NASA had created a, uh, uh, the Hubble spacecraft. Uh, and it, it's, it's one of the most uh, powerful telescopes known to man at this point. You know, after spending $1.5 billion, they had the best telescope in the world. And so, uh, they went around justifying the expense. We would see so much more. We would see so many, so many things deeper in space and we'd be able to take those images and enhance them and just make them look so defined and stuff. So they justified the expense on this. But you know, I, I couldn't help but to think to step back and look up at the earth, up at the skies. I often do, especially when we camp. That's one of the things we love to do is just sit around a campfire and you look up and you see the stars and stuff. Our lives, our eyes are limited. Right? Yes. We can only see so far. And, and, and some of the misconceptions is, is we sing that twinkle, twinkle little star. Right? And because why do you do that? You, you're seeing up there, you see those stars, uh, uh, stars twinkling a little bit. You see them flickering and stuff. And, but it's not the stars themselves, but rather the pockets of gases that's between your vision and that star, causing it to twinkle. But yet, so we got that misconception. So we can only see so much. But the Hubble telescope allows us to see places we can never, not see or make it up. Looking at life through the stained glass means you're not going to see clearly. And the Bible even brings a scripture like that, that we see God from this perspective. Things that are temporary around us. Things that can burn and decay and go away. We see God through the temporary here when we're trying to understand an eternal God. And we're at best trying to understand Him without reading His Word. Because we got doubts there. 
got three or four Bibles in the home, and we don't pick up one of them. And yet we got questions. We, we, it's hard, simply put, to understand an eternal God from a temporary perspective. How can there be so much suffering in the world and yet have a loving God? So 20 years of research, $1.5 billion later, and on May 20th, 1990, Hubble begins to transmit pictures back to uh, NASA. And it was, it was, it was like dial, AOL, or it's not fast internet speed. It was like really slow <laughs> stuff. So it's downloading, right? So the image downloads, and guess what? The first picture comes back, and they're all around it. They're all excited, and it's blurry. It's not detailed. And so in disappointment, they're scattering around to see what the problem may be. And, and here what they figured out is one of the lenses had been miscalibrated when they put it in this $1.5 million apparatus, this machine. And so now they're figuring out what in the world are we going to do? It's too expensive just to go up there. And, and, and or to, to build another one and just go up there and put, put the right one in. What do we do? And they run around and are trying to figure out the solution. So basically their answer to this problem was they, they would build another, they would build a big contact lens. And basically what this was doing, the problem was it made bubble nearsighted. The lens was miscalibrated and they could only see right in front of them. They needed it to see far away. So what they did with this new idea is they made this contact lens to where it would reverse the effect. And then they, they would put this lens up there. So they, they didn't have to build this big old machine or anything, but they did put it up on the next flight up to space on a shuttle and they fixed the problem. So we see in this next picture here, the first image that they received was this. And then the second one, after they corrected the problem, was that other one. You can see the difference from blurry to clear. Never before have they been able to see like God's creation in this way. Now, I want you to stay with me on this one. When Hubble was seen blurry, it wasn't the Milky Way galaxy's fault, was it? It was a lens problem, wasn't it? Leadership guru Stephen Covey once said, we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. We see the world as we are conditioned to see it. Our problems kind of create us to see with blurry sometimes. It's never more frustrating for me. I got contact lenses in and stuff, but sometimes they work okay, sometimes not so much. And uh, uh, not long ago, I was really frustrated with, with my contacts. I'm like, I, I put a solution on, I did everything they told me to do, and they're new contacts, and I put them in each eye, and, and, and I'm blurry. And it's, it's frustrating because in my line of work, and from day to day, I want to see. I want to see where I'm going, what I'm doing, and, and everything, right? So I put them in, and they're blurry. I'm giving them a little bit of time. I'm putting more solution in my eyes. I'm flipping them inside out, putting them back in. I'm switching eyes. I'm doing everything I'm going to do. So I finally called the, the, the eye doctor, and I said, hey, tell me what's going on. It was my right eye specifically. I couldn't get it right. And, and just real quick, a little historical but the last prescription they gave me, they put the L on the wrong box and the R on, you know. On the other. So I had them, I, so when I switched them back, I saw clearly, okay. So, so thinking that that could be a problem this time, I called them and said, hey, I've tried switching them, I've tried this and that, and it's, nothing's working. Well, read me the prescription, they said, off the right box. And I looked at it and I read it off to them. Well, sir, you got the wrong box. We gave you the wrong box. I said, well, I need the right box. <laughs> and, uh, you know, being that this is the second time of administration where things have been messed up, and they've since corrected that, but I'm a little frustrated now because I've went through this little battle and stuff like that. I want to see. I want to see clearly. I read a lot. I, I do things. And 
they made it right, and, and, and I was able to see clear. But I couldn't help but to think, how often are we frustrated with God, but it's really not God's fault. There's no more than it was the Milky Way Galaxy's fault. It was a lens problem. It was, it was the way we look upon God because of our problems, because of our exposures to this and that. We're, we're seeing God as we're conditioned to see Him through our problems. And then we hear these things on college campuses. And then we hear these things on the news. And then we hear this in, in the politics and stuff. And, and all of a sudden we see a shift even further away from God to distort our view of God even further. As if the creation looks to the Creator and says, I completely understand you. I think not. Suffering, it's not an obstacle to you being used by God. It's an opportunity for you to be used like never before. Let me say it again. Suffering is not an obstacle to you being used by God, but rather an opportunity for you to be used like never before. We need to look at our problems differently. We need to look at them not to erase that they're happily, they're, that, we're, that, that we're happy that it's happening to us. I'm not saying that. But there is purpose within that pain somewhere. There is God's, God's will for us, not the problem, but for us in this problem. Somehow, some, other, some way, God wants to use us. And we're not allowing Him to use us because we're so focused on the problem. And here's some truths I think you can take away from the message. There's three truths. If you have your bulletin today, I don't want you to jot them down. We're going to move fairly quickly. First one, don't rely on the naked eye. Don't rely on the naked eye. And what this means is without any help from anything you see on your own. It's like, I'm, I got the life figured out, I'm going to walk this journey on my own, and I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. That's what I mean by don't rely on the naked eye. What I'm trying to tell you is rely on God's sight. Rely on God's word to guide you. Because God's word says it will be a light, unto your uh, uh, a light unto your path. It's going to guide you down the way. When the way seems very narrow. When you can't tell the difference between black and white and everything's gray. God's word is going to define that path for you. A lot of people say, well, I can't make a decision. you got this idea and this uh, idea over here. God's Word. you got to rely on God's Word to be your God. you got to put your faith in God's Word, your trust in God's Word. It is the Word of God. All you have to do is look at John chapter 1. It says the Word is God. The Word is what we have to trust on, not the naked eye. Hebrews 11 is filled with those of faith. Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, and the people of faith who walked and trusted God. And because they did, they left behind a legacy. Now I want to tell you a story, a brief story in 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. This is about Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is a prophet of God. Elisha is his servant right now. Elijah has been journeying with God, trusting God, going through some amazing things. Elisha is still learning the way. And they're in the midst <coughs> of a situation. They are encamped around by the enemy of another king. And this king specifically wants to kill Elijah because Elijah, being a prophet of God, is revealing to the king of Israel the enemy's plan. And the enemy can't have that. So the enemy says, I'm getting tired of not winning against Israel. Who's causing them to have the upper hand? And then they say, well, they got a prophet named Elijah. Well, then we need to go after him. They find Elijah in this town. And they encamped the whole town. So everybody's in an uproar when you start seeing horses and chariots and army soldiers and stuff like that. They're there to kill Elijah. 
And we pick it up there. Verse 15, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and they went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, we should, what should we do? You know, this, when you don't have vision, this is how you respond. When you can't see God, this is how we respond. Oh my God, what are we going to do? Verse 16, he said, do not be afraid. So the first thing is, cast out fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open up his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened up the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with, their, with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way. And this is not the city. Follow me. Basically, Elisha was, was, was the, why they were blind and not seeing. And he said, hey, you're in the wrong place. This is not the right city. And we're going to lead you over this way. And they were more than willing to go. And, and so they went. <coughs> Follow me and I will bring you to the man you see. And they led them to Samaria. We need to see our trials as opportunities to grow in God and come close to Jesus Christ. God says, my grace is made perfect in weakness. When you're at your weakest, God's grace should abound. <clears throat> Romans 10, 17. How do we grow in our faith? How do we get more faith? Well, the Bible tells you in Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing. 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 And hearing through the word. word of Christ. And it's written, written in the Bible. So when we get up and we start our day and we start it with the cup of coffee and the breakfast and the, and the toast or whatever it is you do, should that not somewhere include the Scriptures? We feed our body physically, but we, we starve it spiritually. God get that breakfast, one of the important meals of the day. God get that cup of joe. It just wakes up the system, in your opinion, and, and you you do certain things, right? To wake up your body. You make sure your lunch is back before you go to work or whatnot, don't you? So that you can sustain the day. Well, we do not do much of anything to sustain our spiritual bodies through the day. And that is my challenge to you. Change it up. Start the word, start the day with the word, because it is by the word that you will gain faith to face your day that in and of itself has its problems and will have its problems. Second part. Train for the trial you are not yet in. <clears throat> Me and Lila, we do supplemental stuff for our marriage and stuff not because we have marital problems, but because when marital problems come, we may be prepared for them. You've got to do the same thing with your faith. You cannot wait till a problem comes knocking on your door before you decide to up your faith. You need to train for the trial you're not yet in. This is about drinking when you're not thirsty and eating when you're not hungry. Having your armor on before the battle starts, there is nothing worse than the feeling of the enemy attacking and you have yet to put your armor on. You have yet, see, this is one of the tactics in wartime is the element of surprise. When the enemy is not ready, guess what the devil looks at you upon like the enemy? You are his enemy. And if he can surprise you, flank you with some spiritual attack you wasn't yet ready for, He's got you in a weak situation. Yeah. <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 44 says, Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Listen, no one knows the hour or the day or the minute, 
You've got to be ready. You've got to be prayed up. You've got to be read up. You've got to be actively involved for God, whether that is through the church, in the mission field, or whatever it is. Luke chapter 12, verse 34 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. Stay dressed for action. I love the way the English Standard Version of the Bible says that. Be dressed for action. <laughs> you get dressed for the readiness of your day, do you not? We've got to spiritually get dressed for our action, for our action in our day. And keep our lamps burning, it says, verse 36. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open up the door for him at once when he comes and knocks. It's like uh, anytime you attend a funeral home and a funeral and stuff, the funeral director or the staff there, they're waiting at the door to open up the door for you as you walk in. They do not want to labor you whatsoever. They want your grieving process to be easy, smooth, and transitional and stuff. So they, they are going out of their way to be, to, to be uh, complimentary to you. And so they're going to open the door for you. Anybody that's ever attended a funeral will see that, right? And that's, that's what the scriptures are telling you this morning. Be ready to the point that you're watching so that you can open the door. Your lamps are full with oil. It's, the light's not going to be snuffed out. First Peter chapter 2. Like newborn infants. Like newborn infants. Long for the pure spiritual milk. That by it you may grow up into your salvation. It's like, it's like the, 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 the salvation is an adult uniform or such. And you're an infant and you got to grow into that you should, before you can wear it completely. Okay? And, and like infants, you know, the baby cries when they come out of the womb. One of the first things it needs to do is eat and, and be with the mother and stuff like that. So, so like infants, we are to be hungry for the Word. Thirsty for the Word. The last point. Let God use your pain. Let God use your pain. God says you will not be in a situation that He cannot provide a way out. We're not looking for the way out because we're so focused on something else. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says this. Three times I pleaded with, this is Paul talking about a pain, a, a suffering he's going through. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace, say my grace. My grace, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with my weaknesses. Insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Look at Job in the Bible. What he endured. Allow your pain to open up your eyes toward God. Allow your pain to open and dilate your soul so that you can see better in the darkness. Because we do live in a fallen world. It is, it does have its darkness. Darkness will come to your door. And you need to see in the darkness. The light will come. And the darkness will go. Because the darkness cannot comprehend the light. You understand? It has no place in the light. So when you put on the eyes of the lion. And you're able to see ten times spiritually better than anybody else. It's because you're ready for the battle. You're dressed for the battle. Your, your sight is focused upon God. Amen? Yes. Let's say it together. Psalm 69, 29 says, But I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. What does that mean? That means God, by His grace, reached down and saved a wretch like me. And He saved a wretch like you. That sometimes we don't have the words to speak. We're not a biblical encyclopedia walking around quoting the word like Jack Van Empty on television. Now I just said, God, I lost. He just quotes the word. Boom, 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 boom. And this, I, I often wondered how He did it. But God blessed Him with the ability to retain God's word. I'm not so much. I've got to think about God's word. I've got to read it 50 times over before I can retain it. 
But listen, I realize that God's grace is all I need. I don't need all the scholarship of the Bible. I don't need to have it all figured out. I just need to rely upon the grace that God gave me. Amen? Amen. Now I'll grow in that grace like God's Word says to. If you believe in this, by your heads, let's close your eyes and let's truly ask ourselves, what is the Holy Spirit trying to teach us through this message? Dear Prince of Heavenly Father, you're, you're asking us as yes, your creation to put up, to have eyes like a lion, Lord God, so that we might see better in the darkness. Lord God, we just see you through eyes uh, that's seen you unclearly. You're not very clear to us. And I pray, Lord God, that each and every one here, Lord God, that reaches out to you, that trusts you this morning. That as the songs play, Lord God, may we submit to you. May, may you speak to us clearly. May you reveal yourself to us clearly, Lord God, as, as, we, as we submit to you. Let us understand, Lord God, that we just need to make our steps closer to you. We need to lean upon your understanding, your vision for our life, and not our own. Let us not walk around, Lord God, making decisions each and every day that exclude you. Let us include you in each and every decision, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.